Beep, 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 beep. Mission possible. So we're here with Ronaldo Brutico, who has an important message about the future of humanity. So, Ronaldo, you mentioned something about lifeboats, and I thought, well, you know, I mean, the, those little rings, those little SOS rings, are too small to save all of humanity. So, what are you talking about? Where did it come from? Sure, I mean, it was, the analogy was Titanic. You yeah. know, one of the problems is they sailed with too few lifeboats. So, the idea of a lifeboat is we're a, we've made a Titanic miscalculation with our environment. And what we need to do is make sure that in case we need a lifeboat, they exist. So the reason we need lifeboats is why? Because um, we're looking at, an, 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 at a negative environmental feedback loop where the CO2 that's been emitted has heated the planet to the point where now we have had massive amounts of, of methane released from permafrost. That in turn is now causing additional heat on the planet, so we're now having massive releases of uh, methane from what are called the hydrate structures under the ocean. Together, those forces have heated the planet to the point now where we are literally, we have almost no glaciers left in the entire country of Switzerland, which was famous for glaciers. Uh, the Arctic Ocean is, you can, you can sail a 21-foot plastic boat through it. That happened three years ago. Uh, so the, the Arctic ice cap in, in the summertime has been completely obliterated, and in the winter it hasn't come back anywhere near its current its traditional size. So all in, in the Greenland ice sheet, is melting so fast now it's almost tough to calculate the speed of the melt. So when you add the all of the water that will be dumped into the oceans from the Greenland ice sheet melting, the Arctic, the Antarctic, and the glaciers that are already being melted, what you end up with was 263 feet of additional sea level. Plus that sea level is now going to be hotter which means the water will expand. So 263 feet above current sea level is the best you can hope for. The methane released from permafrost aggregated the heat that was generated by the CO2. Methane is about 40 times more heat generating than CO2 on initial release. It dissipates a little quicker, but it's 40 times worse on release. So that methane all started to come up. It's been released in massive quantities from uh, the permafrost. On top of that, the heat has gotten so bad that the oceans now are belching up even larger quantities of methane, which have been trapped there for millions of years in the ocean floor. And I mean, there are places in the Arctic Ocean, for example, like there's a, about a four or five square kilometer area where so much gas, methane gas, is bubbling up now being released from the ocean floor because of the heat of the water, which is about four and a half degrees hotter than it was just 10 years ago. Four and a half degrees Fahrenheit hotter than it was 10 years ago in the Arctic. Okay? Well, it's belching up so much methane that what's happening is it looks like a fish feeding frenzy. The gas bubbles are that visible. Uh, the Himalaya High Plateau, which is full of glaciers, which feed the five great rivers of Asia, all being melted to the point where they're no longer going to be able to feed those rivers. So think of the billions of people who live in Asia. Just the Ganges alone is going to go dry. And the Ganges alone, you're talking about 150 million people depend on it. Plus, those 150 million will then have to kill for water that they can't get, or they'll die in the process. So how do you stabilize the glaciers that feed the Ganges, the, the, the Yellow River, etc.? How do you, how, what do you do in the Yangtze? How do you stabilize? Well, you're going to have to cool the planet while you're bringing the CO2 levels down so that the methane goes back in. When that ice is gone, then you're now you're generating even faster heater, even faster and faster and faster. So what we have to do is stop melting the glaciers immediately and allow for nature to rebuild them through natural cycles of snowfall and have the glaciers grow again. Well, how do you do it? You have to cool the planet while you're reducing CO2 emissions. There is a way to do that. What, what I want to go back to though is you, you raised an eyebrow over the idea that the fossil fuel companies have been see, sucking the blood of human civilization like leeches. Uh, people don't realize the amount of, of wealth that is destroyed by the, uh, the greed, the rapacious greed of the fossil fuel companies. They have no idea. So when you suck a dollar out of uh, somebody's pocket because they had to put it in their gas tank, that's a dollar they can't pay the, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. There's some, it, it means what they did is they captured human society and they enslaved it. Right. So we've now been enslaved by the fossil fuel companies. What happens when you break that is you cause an explosion of economic wealth. I mean, it's unbelievable. So how do we break it? Uh, we've developed a blueprint for how to take the state of California off of all fossil fuels and nuclear within 10 years or less at no, no additional expense to the ratepayers. People don't realize that they're overpaying for the stuff they're getting. Mm -hmm. That's what's going on. So the oil companies told us we didn't want small cars, but we found out we love small cars and they get great gas mileage, and the oil companies are hurting as a result. 
Okay, oil's right now selling for $98 to $102 a barrel. If they had their way, it'd be selling for $200 a barrel. They can't push it that high because we've learned that we can get along without it. So we, we no longer accept that a car that gets 12 miles to the gallon is smart. Five, ten years ago, that was considered the optimum, right? A Hummer was eight to ten miles to the gallon, right. and everybody thought it was a status symbol. Now you see somebody driving a Hummer, you go, what a jerk. <laughs> That's crazy. Right. Not, only, not only does it not make sense economically for them, it's like, how could you do that to the planet? How could you suck that much up? Right. Right. The super wealthy or the people that can have a really big impact economically, what are they talking about now in regards to this? That's the great news. The most encouraging thing I can talk about is this meeting was called the Meeting on Inclusive Capitalism in London about three months ago. And um, when Lady Rothschild, who convened the meeting, convened it, she asked, there were 300 of us who were invited to attend. And I was extraordinarily flattered and surprised to be invited. I got invited because of the World Business Academy, because we're an NGO that's looking at these issues and has done so with some credibility over a long period of time. And so she opens up the meeting. She says, I would like, I want, first of all, I want to thank the 300 of you for showing up. This is in this extraordinarily ornate room in, this, in the city of London's main hall, like, you know, from the 16th, 17th century with this very gilded look. She says, look around the room. There's 300 of you sitting here. Together you represent $34 trillion. Now that's astounding because the entire global GDP is only about 64 trillion. So you get these enormous sovereign wealth funds, which are these aggregations of money in vast amounts that are directed by the countries who accumulated them, who in effect are the ultimate investors. So the only thing bigger than the banks are the sovereign wealth funds who own the banks. That's the shareholders. And these 300 people control basically half the global economy. A lot for 300 people to control when you think about it. And at that meeting, there were three things that uh, the, uh, the Prince of Wales covered, that uh, Bill Clinton covered, uh, that uh, Christian from the uh, International Monetary Fund covered, uh, uh, and the uh, Hugh Carey, uh, Mark Carrier, the governor of the Bank of England covered, and, and, and then a, a number of other people who spoke. But those are the, the highlighters. In fact, that's, it's pretty amazing to get that many high that group of people in one room at one time. Bill Clinton came for the whole meeting. He didn't just like come give a speech and leave. He sat there all day and participated. And um, what they talked about were three things. They said, uh, and Christian Legrand really laid it out cold. She said, the disparity between rich and poor has gotten to the point where it's going to collapse the democratic capitalist system. We are in imminent jeopardy of peril. We're in imminent peril of collapse. And that's a huge thing to say if you're the head of the International Monetary Fund. It's a big thing to say, particularly the guys who own the system. She said, basically, you own the system, and the system's about to collapse. She quoted from Karl Marx. She quoted from Das Kapital. She said, the seeds of capitalism and destruction is sown by the fact that capitalism, the rich, will tend to get richer because they will want to be, they'll be greedy, and they'll aggregate more power and wealth to themselves, letting the poorer class sink further and further behind until there's class warfare, and that will be the end of capitalism. So that was Karl Marx. And she looked around the room, by the way, quoted it from memory. She looked around the room and she said, our job in this room is to prove that Karl Marx was wrong. Incredible statement. She said, so we got to close the gap between rich and poor. Within 10 days after she gave that speech, the chairman of Goldman Sachs, which is probably the most powerful investment bank in the world, said, we got to close the gap between rich and poor. We went too far. That's, Lloyd Blankfein would never have said that if it hadn't come out of that room. The memo went out. The sovereign wealth funds realized, she's right. We, got, we went too far. And we've got to start taking care of people. And then she second thing to talk about besides the gap between rich and poor was climate change. And she said that, and, the, and several speakers said, climate change is far worse than the press is reporting, and we all know that. So what we have to do is, like, we have to get, get real. If we don't deal with climate change, it's not survivable. If we were going to avert the need for lifeboats tomorrow, what would we do? It's relatively simple. First of all, we're at 406 parts per million CO2 concentration. We've got to get that bound to th back down to 350 or less. Perfect. How do you do that? You have to stop burning fossil fuels. Now, the unfortunate thing is we'll burn more tomorrow than we did today. Uh, however, on the bright side, look at the fact that the coal industry, which was called King Coal for 70 to 100 years, the coal industry is virtually bankrupt now. It's, it's virtually over. Even the country of Australia, which has been on a huge economic boom for the last 12 years, is now going into recession because they're buying China's buying just a little less coal than they used to buy. A few minerals less than they used to buy. It's already started, okay? Number two, you have to then chill the planet 
you, it's got a fever. So the last, when you put more CO2 in the air, it's like putting a blanket on a child with a fever, which you would never do would kill it, because it causes the fever to go up. We've seen this in history before. When people in, um, say, 1700, uh, had no idea what would happen to the wealth on the planet when they went from burning wood to burning coal. Astronomical explosion of wealth. By 1800, we, we, we max, we, I'm going to guess we probably grew the global national product by about 8 to 10 fold, 8 to 10 X. Then, coming around 1890, because we discovered oil in Pennsylvania in about 1865, 1870, and we started using it by 1890. By 1900, it was pretty clear we were going to switch off of coal to this more efficient energy form called oil. Now, what's interesting about oil is it's a less dense carbon form than coal. So by going to a less dense carbon form, but higher energy per, per unit, we ended up with, compare the wealth of the, of the world in, in 1900 to the wealth of the world 100 years later in the year 2000. Right. Enormous, I mean, it's, another get 8, 10x multiple at least. And that's with all the wars in between where we caused all kinds of things to happen that destroyed yeah, yeah. yeah. So now you're, the, the latest one is we're going from oil to gas. So everybody generally believes that one of the reasons the U.S. economy is doing so well is because gas is so cheap because of fracking, which the academy is very much against, by the way. We're yeah. very much against fracking. But the fact that this less dense carbon form, gas, half the carbon density of oil, is economically so much more desirable and is unlo unleashing another 2, 3x growth in economic activity. Mm -hmm. And what we're saying is the next release will be when you go to zero carbon, to hydrogen. So the planet will, human civilization eventually will get to a hydrogen economy. We hope it will do so before we have to go to lifeboat. Beep, 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 beep. Mission possible.